Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 577. That's Cinco Siete Siete with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Wherever this podcast may find you. Great, amazing. How am I? As you can tell from the sound of my voice, from the tone of my voice and from the loudness and clarity of my voice, I'm feeling great because guess what? The sun is shining. The sun is shining through my window as I'm recording this and I'm feeling elated after I record this. I'm going to start work. Then around, you know, three or four hours into work, I'm going to pop out and go to the gym for an hour. Then I'm going to come back in, record some more stuff and I'm going to be living my life. I absolutely, I absolutely love and I'm pretty much ashamed and embarrassed about how much the weather legitimately affects my um, mood. I never thought I was one of those kind of guys. I'm one of those suck it up and move on. I'm one of those, you know, um, facts over feelings. I'm one of those, why are you celebrating your own birthday with a tweet? Why are you posting a picture of yourself drinking alone on your own birthday? Why are you resharing everyone's birthday messages to you? Um, why are you posting birthday weeks, birthday months? I'm a moody, grumpy son of a gun, right? But for whatever reason, for whatever reason, when the sun shines, it puts me in a great mood. When I look outside my window and I see blue skies, I'm like, wow, this reminds me of Lanzarote where I was recently. Jesus, how amazing and how lovely is this? So I'm really, really happy that the sun is shining. I'm really happy that I get to speak to you guys again and I'm living my best life, living my best life. As you guys know, this is the number one cultural commentary podcast in the world as voted by you. If you like what you hear and you like what you see, why don't you give me back some love by smashing the like button, by sharing it if you listen to the audio podcast, by subscribing to the YouTube if you're watching it on YouTube, and maybe if you do like it by the end, why not subscribe to my Patreon? I upload one bonus episode on there per week. I upload the one on Sunday. Another one's going out tomorrow. So if you want to jump on there and get involved with the Patreon community and have bonus episode stuff that never goes on anywhere else it's not like i'm going to put bonus episodes there and upload them later on my main platform no bonus episodes stay bonus and they're only on patreon and again how much is it agostino it's only a dollar it's only as low as a dollar to subscribe to my patreon there's other tiers that you can go into but to subscribe and to get in the door it's only one dollar that's nothing that's less than a coffee that you're going to get at starbucks or at pret a manger or at eat or any other you know place that you have in your locale join us a Join the Patreon, get involved, support the kid. Any support that gets built up through Patreon will, of course, go to making this podcast much better than what it is. In the long term, my long term hope is to have enough money coming in from the Patreon that I can then just go and hire a studio and have that be my permanent studio where I do the podcast in. I'm pretty okay with doing that. Um, of course, the kind of, you know, the immediate to short term goals will be to kind of improve the camera, get a GoPro, um, obviously improve my desk situation, all that kind of stuff that I can do inside the studio I have at the moment. But long term goal is obviously to get a studio to all that. So if you'd like to see that, then why don't you back the Patreon, get involved? And I'd be, of course, grateful for any support you guys give on that one. I would appreciate it. But yeah, here we are back again in the hot seat, cultural commentary podcast, the thing that I absolutely love to talk about because I have loads of opinions on this kind of stuff, as you can tell from the excitement in my voice when I do speak about these things. So news number one to get into, pretty bleak to start off with, but I thought we'd get this out of the way. This is courtesy of TMZ. And it says, Mac Miller, RIP the GOAT, drug dealer who sold deadly pills handed a 17-year sentence. I think this is the second guy now. It says, another man responsible for selling Mac Miller fentanyl that contained, sorry, that contributed to his fatal overdose will be behind bars for a long time. Stephen Walter, 49, was handed a 17.5 sentence after pleading guilty to distributing fentanyl and ultimately resulted in Mac Miller's death back in September 2018. That's a pretty cool sketch. I'm not going to lie of the guy. Um, it continues. Another man, 39 year old Ryan Revis also pleaded guilty to the uh, drug distribution charge and was sentenced to more than 10 years. So, the guy that distributed the goods, the goods, right, the plug in some extent, um, was handed 10 years, and the guy that actually handed it to him was handed 17. The case against the third man by the name of Cameron Pettit remains pending. As we reported, Miller died of a, f fatal, uh, con a fatal cock cocotin. Is that how you say that? 
concoction. So concoction. I can't say concoction. As reported, Mac Miller died of a um, fatal concoction of fentanyl, cocaine, and alcohol. And Walter told the courts that Mac's family he was truly remorseful for his actions. Um, so I'm assuming the cocaine contained enough fentanyl to kill him essentially that's what basically end up killing him not the cocaine obviously because in the u.s and in other parts of the world dealers now they have the, you know it's bad enough that the dealers cut coke with like um what's that thing they cut it with oh it's like a, it, it's like a laxative right they cut it with that sort of stuff it's bad enough that they use that but nowadays they're going uh, you know they're going overboard and using stuff like fentanyl um which is meant to from what i've read fentanyl is meant to have a really kind of um, outsized impact on the coke so if you put a tiny bit of fentanyl in it it can make good coke seem it can make bad coke seem like it's pretty decent but obviously if you go over the amount it can be fatal so it's similar to ghb in that way i'm assuming ghb from people that take it in like gay clubs and whatnot it's good in certain amounts which is why people usually fill it up in those little lids of a drink bottle you're doing and that's all you're meant to be doing you're not meant to drink with alcohol and stuff but obviously if you know you're partying you're probably going to be too loose and too crazy and you're going to forget the dosages so when you go over that dosage is when things start to get really dicey as uh, brendan Schub will say dicey dicey <laughs> anyway let's continue um water told the course that he was remorseful um on april 20 on april 2022 a tweet from independent stats collector charts state that mac miller is this is the best-selling streamer to okay cool so what do i think about this i'm a little bit in two minds personally a part of me is of the thinking where I truly believe that drug laws and the, the basic illegality of, of drugs is what causes this issue primarily. I think if drugs are illegal, and that includes class A drugs, that includes all the hard drugs, smack, crack, whatever it may be. If you let adults make adult decisions on the drugs that they want to ingest, I don't think you're going to have a fentanyl issue. But because of what's happened with covid you know the supply chain with normal goods was really distrib was really just um what you call it uh what's that word called was really um disturbed or whatever is that what the word i'm looking for i don't know what i'm looking for but whatever you know what i mean right the um, yeah that was obviously hurt by covid so you can just imagine what happened to drugs <coughs> and off the back of that too i'm not sure if some of you are aware but a really massive um, drug hit happened. No, a, ma a massive um, operation happened. I'm assuming, if I'm remembering correctly, maybe in the beginning or in the middle of kind of the pandemic time, where the world drug authorities ended up cracking down on a global drug network that primarily existed off of this particular phone that you had to buy. And it was like an encrypted chat. I think it was called like EncroChat or something. And supposedly, if you read the, the information out there from the experts, EncroChat... <coughs> Was responsible for a huge number. <coughs> oh God! Sorry, that's hay fever there. Let me actually drink some water. <coughs> wow! <coughs> God damn it! Hay fever is kicking my ass. <coughs> so let's start again. Yeah. Wow! See that hay fever kicking my ass? Lovely day, but that's what happens to me. The day's lovely, but they end up getting hit in the face with all this stuff. Anyway, we continue. So. If you read all the accounts from the experts, the whole drug trade was really disturbed during the pandemic because obviously things couldn't move around as freely. Especially in the beginning, people weren't buying drugs as much as were in the past. And then in general, those hits that they did on EncroChat ended up taking out some really big players. People who were at the, at the time sorry, supplying pretty good high quality drugs. So... Then there was some sort of power vacuum and obviously there was a gap in shortage of supply. So the people that did step in, they stepped in with, you know, not the best resources. They stepped in with maybe not the best connects, not the best quality of product. And they had to make up for that gap because people still want the drugs. <laughs> and unfortunately, there are some people out there also who don't care about the quality of the drugs they get. As long as they get them in their hand, they're not bothered. So that is what kind of created the fentanyl epidemic that we have going on at the moment now. Is, I think it's this draconian, sorry, I keep hiccuping. The draconian drug laws is what's put us in this really horrible position. It really, really has. And I wish we could live in a society where regular adults could make informed adult decisions on, sorry, on their drug usage. But that's not the reality that we're living at the moment. Another part of me also thinks if you're willing to go out and risk your life by taking drugs knowing like this fentanyl issue exists you have to be prepared for any and all outcomes 
maybe that's a radical thing for me because I'm always somebody who adopts the whole um how do you say I would phrase it as like radical responsibility kind of mindset right where no radical personal responsibility <clears throat> where instead of pointing the finger at others I usually always try to seek personal inventory and to figure out why the things that I did that were in my control could have contributed to the position that I'm in, in in any given moment or could contribute to the reason why so-and-so is happening to me, right? That's why I always try and do. And personally, I don't think it's entirely fair to blame these dealers for Mac Miller's death because it's bigger than that. Because, of course, the people that they got them from are way, way, way up the food... Sorry, way up the food chain. But, of course, the police can't get those guys. And then I guess because Mac Miller, because he's so beloved and so well regarded by people and it was such a tragic way for him to pass, especially when, you know... If you're a fan of his music, you'll know he always struggled with cocaine addiction anyway and, you know, substance abuse and alcohol issues. So to hear him finally have to succumb to it, which is tragic. And I guess if you want to blame somebody, you're going to have to blame the people that handed it to him, knowing full well that the drugs had fentanyl in it. Now, to be fair to the guys, it's not like every time you buy your drugs from the plug, they're going to tell you it's got fentanyl. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It depends on who it is from what I read online. I read online and sometimes also the bad thing about the situation is that fentanyl isn't just added on the street as some people were thinking it's actually added at the source so if it's added at the source it's really impossible to you know extract it from there by the time it, it gets to you and it'll probably be too much work for it for not enough gain it doesn't really make any sense and um yeah and unfortunately it's just the name of the game in it so i do really feel bad for mac and his family you know, because this is obviously preventable. If the drugs were clean, he would be completely fine. People people are functioning. There's plenty, plenty of functioning addicts out there who are able to take a couple of bumps in the toilet as they're going to work or as they're at work and then continue working. I obviously wouldn't advise that. and would tell people to kind of treat drugs like a recreational thing as you do, you know, eating fast food and stuff like that. You don't do it every single day. You do it when, you know, when you're basically bored and got nothing nothing else to do or you want to spice up your weekend but it should be something you do on a daily basis but some people do if that's the case then it's more than likely we can say if that coke never had fentanyl in it mac miller would still be around with us now i mean his presence will still be felt he'll still be releasing great music he'll still be a family friend you know a family member a dad whatever he was going to end up being in the future that would be in his in his, in his you know in his eye hindsight but unfortunately that didn't end up happening the way you know we would have liked it to happen so r.i.p mac miller really is a young legend um you know force and feelings got to his close family and friends and it's just an unfortunate situation all around it really really is oh my god the hiccups are mad man is there a way to stop this shit hold on i've got to drink this water and make sure that i don't why do you have you against to hold your nose Anyway, <clears throat> hiccups are mad, brother. Wow, that felt all the way bad, didn't it? Okay, cool. There you go. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully that got so hopefully that got sorted. Hold on, Jesus, why am I hiccuping up so much? Come on! <clears throat> oh my God, I wish I could stop this. Is there a way to stop this? There's not really, is there? Okay, come on, let's stop this. Hopefully, hopefully it stops. I'm waiting for it to stop. Oh, there we go. It goes again. My word, is this going to continue forever? Because I'm going to have to stop this and record this later if it's going to continue this forever. Because I don't want to to be the hiccup boy all the way through as I'm fucking recording a podcast. That is not fun at all. As you can tell. Not the funnest time in the world at all. <sighs> Come on, stop hiccuping, please, if you don't mind. Come on, son. Come on, son. <clears throat> Come on, son. Okay, there we go. I think it might stop now, maybe. <coughs> yeah, there we go. I think it might stop. So thankful. Jesus Christ. I'm really sorry about that, guys. Really, really do apologize. Anyway, we move on quickly. I wanted to quickly touch upon this. I'm not, usually I'm not somebody to post screenshots of my own tweets, but I thought because I was the only person that kind of was able to pull this reference and make this correlation, I thought it might be beneficial to put it up on the screen. So please forgive the narcissistic um, display here that I'm now, you know, subjecting you to, but it is what it is. So I was perusing the timeline and I know, happened to notice this Instagram tweet 
that somebody posted. Um, it was a screenshot taken from the lovely Taylor Lorenz where she was talking about the Amber Heard v. Johnny Depp case. And for whatever reason, again, I haven't been paying attention to the Amber Heard Johnny Depp case. I think it's irrelevant for the wide majority of the public. Yes, it's a soap opera, but essentially it's two very toxic people who shouldn't have been together at all or should have broke it off way before it got to the point that it's got to basically, um, you know, shouting at each other in court through lawyers. Um, whoever's guilty, whoever's innocent, whatever, go on all your life, but it's not nothing to really get our teeth sunk into. I think, in my opinion, they're both as bad as each other to varying degrees, but it's not something that I'm going to be overly, you know, invested in. But for whatever reason, in the last few weeks, no, so for the entire narrative, if you've been watching for afar, has been that Amber Heard is like a manipulative, evil person, right, who had basically used her femininity, her womanhood as a mask for her abuse to Johnny Depp and sometimes you know in domestic violence cases or in just you know issues concerning men and women um usually if it's a victim it's usually always a woman and if you are a woman and you say something happened to you people always believe you straight up but in this case it sounds like by the things I've been looking for on the outside in that this might be one of those rare cases where Johnny Depp was the one who was a victim of abuse and Amber Heard was the abuser but she's obviously been hiding behind the womanhood thing cool and maybe her looks whatever it may be and for the entire for the entire time of the court case, that's been the, the 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 running narrative that Amber Heard is a horrible person. Cool, no problem with that. I don't really care about either of them. But for whatever reason, in the last few weeks, the narrative has now switched, where some of these people on the left, these like radical leftists and stuff, are now starting to sympathise with Amber Heard and say that she's actually a victim in this. And just because, and just because, um, you know, she's a victim in this even though whatever she's done is bad, that, that Johnny Depp is still maybe worse. But then there's another narrative in this now, which Taylor Lorenz says in this screenshot, where she essentially says in this tweet, abuse is about power and she didn't have the power. I don't think a lot of people don't understand that abusive relationships actually look like. Julia Fox put it well. Um, so essentially she's saying that just because Johnny Depp is a man doesn't mean... No, no, she don't. Sorry. What she's basically trying to say is that in this relationship, because Johnny Depp was the more famous person, that he has power over her in that case to abuse her. And she was like a little kind of scrappy actress coming up. That's what I think she's essentially saying. But Julia Fox basically elaborates on that or you know, made her own point, I guess, on Instagram, where she says, wrong. She never had the power in a relationship to be abusive. So you can't be abusive if you don't have power in a relationship. This is what Julia Fox is saying. Did she hit him? Yes. Was it abuse? No, because she's a girl, I guess. Um, you need to have power to have able to abuse people. She was 25. He clearly was a way, always way more powerful, including physically and financially. So because Johnny Depp is older, not his fault. Because he's a man, not his fault. Um, because he's successful, not his fault. It means that he has to be the abuser in his relationship, even though all the evidence is pointing towards Amber Heard being abusive in her own way. Whether it's not all abuse, whether it's not all physical, it might be some mental, whatever it may be. Just strange, bizarre. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. But this is the narrative people are spinning with. So Julia Fox is kind of waving that kind of victimhood and flag and, you know, right on top of her head and really screaming from the rooftops that Amber Heard is also a victim in this, which is absolutely nutty. But let's just continue. I thought that was really interesting for her to say because then the very next week or, you know, the presiding days, wherever it may have been, there was this um, engineered photo shoot paparazzi thing that she's doing in the style of what Kanye was doing with, with his Yeezy Supply um, company, a clothing brand, sorry, where she kind of gets paparazzi to come and take pictures of her while she's running errands and whatnot, where she's looking amazing, obviously, right? Um, great outfit, all denim with the flipping uh, little bikini set on with the knee-high boots but according to people online this outfit is sponsored by none other than alexander wang and i'm just thinking if you're julia fox and you're advocating for victims or you're saying that amber heard is a victim in this because she was a person who didn't have power in this even though all the evidence is pointing towards her manipulating and controlling joined up to some certain extent who knows what it is really but i don't really care i haven't looked into deeply but essentially you are taking a position of the minority out there who have you know uh, the ability to deduce things that are going on with a rational mind and you're now saying that amber has a victim which is fine 
So if you're going to be a victimhood person, how can you then wear Alexander Wang clothing knowing full well what he did when he was coming up, right? No, what, what he did a few, what was it, months ago. And if you want a uh, refresher on that, this is an article courtesy of Instinct. And it said, did Alexander, did Alexander Wang's lawsuit get dropped? Um uh, the yesterday fashion designer Alexander Wang released a statement and apology over the sexual assault and harassment allegations placed against him. The, the. So if you remember, there was a time when several peak, several male models on TikTok basically came out with stories and accounts of Alexander Wang being extremely, extremely sexually aggressive um, around the fashion scene, whether it was after shows, after parties. And in one occasion, or I think in a couple of instances, there was alleged instances of him dousing or dosing some of the guys drinks with mdma ketamine and some other stuff right this is what i remember i'm not sure my, my brain's fuzzy again it's all alleged and allegedly these guys woke up and you know something had happened or whatever it may have been which are really troubling and disturbing allegations to put against somebody but for whatever reason whatever financial backing alexander wang had still had it his ability to you know to have his stuff showcased on vogue runway is still there he's still stocked by some of the biggest stores in the world all this stuff happened so it's very interesting and weird reaction towards a pretty serious allegation but of course we know why that happened because it involves men if Alexander Wang would have done this to some young girls coming up in the industry, the reaction would have been completely different. But because he's doing it to guys uh, who may who may or may not be gay, but essentially they're men, it's not such a big issue. It's not such a big deal. On top of that, the other disappointing fact about it was that I guess these victims um, ended up meeting up again. And this is, this is um, a quote from Lisa Bloom. Ended up meeting up with Alexander Wang and his representative and ended up, I guess, um, coming to an amicable conclusion, which you would imagine would be the De Niro, the pounds, the money, the whatever it may be, the dollars, and ended up dropping any kind of legal proceedings that they were going to take against him. Maybe it was because they maybe thought they couldn't prove it in a court of law because it might be in the he should see said. I'm not really too sure but that was a disappointing thing to see that these victims who clearly had went through a very traumatic experience with alexander wang would take the easy route out but again they're the victims if they choose to take the easy route out then it is what it is we have to move on but this was an actual thing that happened you don't you know agree to meet victims and acknowledge your fault in this like he did in the statement or whatever it may be no he didn't acknowledge fault really he didn't did he a number of individuals come forward recently to raise claims against me and regarding my past my past personal behavior very clever there i support their right to come forward and i've listened to carefully to what they have to say i was not easy for me to share these stories um for them sorry and i regret acting in a way that caused them pain so acknowledgement of it, he did do it so i guess this, this might have been part of the this might have been part of the agreement that they had. He comes out and acknowledges he did it and then they kind of get a nice kind of golden handshake to move on. But this actually did happen, right? Lisa Bloom came out, the lawyer for this victim and said, we met Alexander Wang and his team. My counsel had the opportunity to speak to him, their truth to him and express their pain and hurt. We acknowledge Mr. Wang's apology and we are moving forward and we have no further comment on this matter. So clearly some sort of golden handshake. Lisa Bloom doesn't do anything for free. And then you've got Julia Fox over here parading in this outfit, courtesy of Alexander Wang. So I just think to myself, when it comes to these people who profess to be social justice warriors, who profess, who profess to be you know, advocates for victims, usually they're full of bullshit. Usually they are laden with hypocrisy, but that's not really an issue for me. I think we are all hypocrites to a certain extent. I know I am. I've got my stings, right? But for the most part, we wear hypocrisy on our chest. We know we're full of shit and we don't try and pretend we're not. But with these people, they think they walk on water. They legitimately think that the positions they're holding are somewhat you know um that that kind of separate them from everybody else right that make them hallowed that make them reasoned monsters that make them clear-eyed people who really see what's going on for what is going on but essentially they're as blinded and they're as ideologically possessed as most of us are anyway in our own ways but they just won't admit it and just be upfront of it but in general i just think if you want to stand on victimhood and you actually want to be an ally you have to go all the way through you can't be supporting people like alexander wang if you're going to be just adv advocating for amber heard being a victim of abuse you just can't do that i just don't think it's right and i just think it's full of hypocrisy and obviously represents you in a really bad light and again it's out of order because i actually like judith fox i think her ability to turn the little bit of light that she got from um you know from obviously uncut gems and then kind of fast forwarding into meeting um kanye and that world in romance i legitimately think her ability to stretch that five minutes into whatever this is now is truly remarkable and i think her understanding of media her 
manipulation of it, her performance art nature of it is really something to be um, respected and sort of like, you know, kind of you have to kind of tip your hat to her in that respect for doing it because in this industry that we're in at the moment in this game currently this is kind of the name of the game if you're not in front of camera if you're not keeping yourself in the news um circuit or whatever it may be you might as well not be alive and considering that she is an a actress and she is somebody that maybe wants to kind of go into other fields it maybe is beneficial to keep doing these kind of things so again i rate the girl i like her but she's full of shit that's basically the point um moving on quickly I want to talk about this. This is a thing I want to touch upon just loosely. But this is regarding Jack Harlow's Pitchfork album review and the rating that his album got and why I think it's unfair in relation to the recent update or recent release of Kendrick Lamar's new album and the score that Pitchfork gave it. So Jack Harlow's recent album that came out is called Come Home, The Kids Miss You, which I think is a terrible album name for an artist at his stage of his career, you know, knowing that he hasn't got any kids and stuff. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, they gave it a 2.9. Then recently, Kendrick Lamar's album came out after, what, a five, six-year hiatus, probably one of his most personable, introspective, raw albums to date. It deals with a, a myriad of issues, especially within the black community. It really strips bare himself, his family, his relationships, his battles with adultery and sex addiction, like many, many things in there. Really good album. Some of the tracks on there are really amazingly done. The one he's got where he's arguing with the other girl um, is incredible. Um, if it legitimately feels like you shouldn't be listening to it. The whole album feels like that. It feels like a, a big therapy session. A really great album with some amazing music moments here and there i would say after a five-year hiatus that should be a, at least a high eight if not a nine but of course pitchfork gave it a 7.6 so if i'm jack harlow and i'm part of his team for all the trolling he's been getting online which i which again i don't think is constructive because i legitimately do think as he said in one of his like, what's that bar he's got like um i think it's in churchill downs um then i'm inevitable then something about him being inevitable or something about he's going to be around you for a long time I forgot what the bar is but he is inevitable and you know he's going to be here for a long time because what we know first of all he's got the look in terms of being a handsome guy obviously he being white is definitely going to help because there's not many white rappers out who are good so if he's halfway decent it's going to allow him to propel his career to a certain extent um he carries himself well He's clearly somebody that everybody in the industry likes as a person because he's friends of all the right people. Um, he's got the right tone of voice. That's something that I always really um, strongly hung up on, tone of voice with rappers. There's certain rappers, uh, one example that always comes to mind straight away is Big Sean, an expert with a pen, an absolutely you know, top-tier MC for the guys that you rate nowadays. Like if you was going to rate and put a top 50 of rappers you know, around in the industry now, you definitely have to put Big Sean's name there. But that voice, that weasel, nasally, DSP-ish type voice, I just absolutely hate and can't stand. To, to the point where his albums sound annoying to me because it's just obviously him on his albums talking. So on the single, not too bad. But if it's an album, it's terrible. And maybe, who knows, other people also feel the same way about his voice than I do. I necessarily I don't think it's to do that. I think it's his inability to put together a good body of work. He's got great singles and great mixtapes, but his albums usually always fall flat to me, Big Sean. But that's one of the reasons why he I think he hasn't been that successful. And I think Jack Harlow has that voice, has that tone in spades. So all he has to do is now do I think the easy part. Because those things are things I think you can't really control. You can't control how good looking you are. You can't control how you carry yourself. You can't control be liked by people, you know, because it's kind of industry stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's not really you that's going to decide it. They have to say, oh, yeah, you're the next guy and then kind of all come and suck your dick. So all these things that he can't control, he's already got in him. The things that he can control in terms of putting together better songs, in terms of crafting them or the construction of them in a way that maybe sounds better to the ear, a way of sequencing the album, because the sequence is nothing all over the place, and maybe a real, real forensic level of um, self, what's that thing called? self-analysis and dissecting of the album because a lot of it should be cut away some fluff here and there like one of the tracks that i'm always going to stick out i think was a real misstep was this track here by pharrell called movie star the front of the the the, the beginning half of the track is pretty mediocre and not really you know um a track that you or production you'd you kind of expect from pharrell williams but then the end of it is classic pharrell williams it really goes to some interesting places like, like it goes in some mad places right 
that should have been the majority of the track. That should have been at the front, and then the other bit should have been at the back. Little tweaks like that would have helped it. Um, I think the sequencing of it was completely all over the place. I think the first five or four tracks kind of sound like they're all one track, if that makes sense. Maybe that was on purpose. I don't really like how that get done, so I would have maybe cut it up a little bit more. I think Churchill Drought Downs came way too late in the whole entire album. That might have maybe set the album for me, if that was me or ended it. I think it came way too far down the list for for such a big track especially considering it was one of maybe drake's standout verses in a very very long time um the the track with justin b with justin timberlake throw it out the window he's completely washed musically nowadays the track with point with little wayne should obviously been a higher to nail tech i don't mind um I, I don't mind i got a shot no i don't mind little secret little secret might have been one of my um, favorite ones too and also maybe side piece um but overall there's a few tracks on here that are just mediocre which i mean but i don't think it's mediocre enough to to say it's a 2.9 it might be a five but i think a 2.9 is clearly people with the industry who maybe don't like the fact that he's being promoted the way he's being promoted people thinking he's an industry plant and trying to use their reviews and their criticism of the album as a way to kind of put him down and i don't think that's fair because you're not judging it fairly because you're already coming in it with prejudices and biases because you don't like him you don't like how he's been pushed or whatever it may be or the people behind him I generally do think there's a talent there. I generally do think there's somebody there who's going to be a big, big star and somebody that people are going to look back on and say, oh, wow, that album actually wasn't as bad as we thought it was. That album uh, maybe set the precedent for this and that. I think it's going to go there. I just hope he, does, he, does, he doesn't take the criticism too much to heart and actually sees it as some somewhat constructive because I do think he has the ability to put good albums together because the album before this was pretty decent. I forgot what the name of it was called. Let me see if I can get up on there. I remember listen to that and i and i didn't actually mind that i thought that was actually quite enjoyable but this one i haven't revisited at all since i listened to it i, I think apart from the pharrell track and a couple of other tracks i haven't really listened to the whole thing but what did he did before that oh that's the yeah um th th that's what they all say where he's hanging out the car window that album was really 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 decent way more than this um and i just think he needs to cut down the tracks he needs to work on the song structure and stuff, but it's not a 2.9 in my opinion. Not at all. That's completely um, out of order in that respect. Then, of course, when you move on to the um, Kendrick Lamar album, putting that as a 7.6, I think, is paramount to maybe having to hand in your journalism card or whatever it may be. Your journalism card, sorry. It has to be, because that doesn't make any sense. After taking a five, six-year hiatus from the industry, he clearly says on the album that he had writer's block. So a, a guy with the pen that Kendrick Lamar has, has writer's block to the extent where he's struggling to even put together words. He's maybe debating and considering whether or not he's actually meant to be a rapper in the long term. Um, he decides to announce that he's going to leave his long-time label and collaborator, TDE, to set up his own imprint. He starts promoting Baby Kim and acting like a music executive a little bit there were many directions he was going in in the background he basically silently got married or engaged to his longtime girlfriend he had a couple of kids right he had he has had actual life experiences that you would assume most artists would maybe dilute or take away from your artistry but this album is absolutely banging banging from start to finish some of the introspective tracks that he speaks about um you know his his struggles with his family um with identity um what's the one particularly that i wanted to mention uh obviously it is the last ones right mother i'm so mother i sober auntie's diaries like pretty pretty good tracks in terms of really getting you kind of um to understand his mental his psyche especially considering he doesn't do that many interviews we cry together but in general the first because i always think great albums always start with great starts and i think the first five tracks of that album even if you'd go to the interlude as a way to kind of cap off that album because you know it's it's kind of plays like a flipping like a screenplay like or like a play itself that's what it kind of plays like right especially with all the skits going on in the background if you wanted to say track one to five is one act then that easily right yeah let's say track one to five is one act let's say track seven to um three of the second disc is two act and then this last one like that is brilliant 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 album that deserves a way higher score than 7.6 it makes absolutely no sense but that's what i mean when i'm talking about the jack harlow score being 2.9 is jack harlow's album actually 2.9 no 
it's probably a five in my opinion if not a, a low f a, a kind of a low four but it's not a 2.9 so that's why i think in some cases these album reviews are pretty irrelevant most of the time you have to listen to music with your own ears and formulate your own opinion as to what you hear uh, based on what you like and what you're looking for in that given time sometimes you go into an album and you just go into it blind just think you know what let me just hear what this person has to say and then kind of take it from there but i think for the most part albums should be go you should listen to albums based off what you want to you just should go into and blind yourself you shouldn't listen or read anybody's reviews and then after the fact if you want to go back and maybe compare what you had to listen to to what they say fair enough but it extends to even movie reviews and tv shows how many tv shows that exist out there that you're absolutely gripped by that some people can't stand one of them i can recognize is maybe first 48 and stuff like that right or fringe this other sci-fi tv show that i was absolutely obsessed with when he came out before i love that show you play for some people they think it's absolutely naff like what the hell is this nonsense it's completely subjective but overall there is an understanding that the top people are the top people and for the most part if Kendrick's taking five years off to put an album together and he delivers this project he delivered in this way it's for a reason and there's no denying this track is fucking brilliant let's think about it the single that he put out right that single isn't even on the album um what's it called uh the heart part five i guess that's probably going to be part of what's these um what's his uh, what's his mixtape he, he does oh what's those mixtapes he does um the one do, 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 let's see what's the mixtapes do you, do you guys remember what i'm talking about section eight yeah section 80 was that a mixtape or is the heart is the heart on all of them i'm pretty sure the heart's on all of them right let me let me check this out here let me go on to pimp a butterfly is the heart on there no it isn't actually okay okay the heart isn't on there is the heart on damned nope there's no heart on damned uh, okay cool so where did he put so the heart only stops at where um good kid mad city no there's not one on there either so where was the heart because he's got one here in it right on section 80 no he doesn't actually okay interesting so maybe they've always been um throwaway tracks and this is overly dedicated overly dedicated doesn't have the heart either okay i didn't know that just literally learning this out loud right now all right, so yeah, one of the best tracks on, you know, that he released, The Heart Part 5, an amazing, an amazing track. That isn't even on the album. That was a throwaway single that he put out. That just shows you the caliber that this man's playing at. Like, he's not to be fooled with, man. I just think that score 7.6 is an absolute insult to artistry. And so that's why I think if his is 7.6, you should completely um, remove from your mind that there's any sort of weight behind the Jack Harlow score either. 2.9 is too low and 7.6 is too low for Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar, the Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers is out now on all platforms that you listen to. I really recommend you check it out. It may be a bit too long for some people who like to have their albums to be a little bit more concise, but I think for an artist like Kendrick, there are certain artists you just should allow to just, you know, put out albums however long they want to put out and you should maybe listen to them all the way through in one go instead of just skipping over it and maybe listen to only the features and i think kendrick is one of the persons that deserves or has earned the right for you to sit down and listen to his music from track one all the way to the end not that he's bothered because if you check social media he's out in ghana living his best life absolutely chilling with all the guys over there and having a great time by all accounts i see him playing football really badly i see him playing fifa i see him having dinner on the beach like he's loving life out there so big up kendrick lamar big up kendrick lamar Moving on quickly from that, we have this news courtesy of Hypebeast regarding a pair of shoes that I am <clears throat> legitimately, legitimately, legitimately intrigued by because by all accounts, these shoes shouldn't really be something I should be interested in because of the size of my feet and because of the bulbous nature of my feet, right? And it is the Nike Cortez Sakai collaborations. Sakai collaborations, as you guys know, have been pretty on the money so far since they started this long and extensive relationship with nike there's never really been an official announcement as to why, how long this relationship is lasting i'm not sure if this is something they do every shoe release they re-up the contract or if it's like a set contract for a set amount of years but it feels like every year there's a different iteration of a sakai nike and they just keep pumping us full of colorways pumping us through of models and for every reason we don't seem to mind we don't seem to actually give a shit that they keep putting out more models they seem to really resonate these are one of the honest i think i've mentioned it other times on this podcast i think i've seen in my day-to-day -day life more people walking around the street wearing sakai nikes than i've seen any other limited edition sneaker 
legit like the most worn one outside of maybe yeezys you know yeezys in terms of a sneakerhead shoe you see l loads of like general public normies wearing a pair of yeezys i've legitimately seen every walk of life wearing a pair of sakai's on the train on the bus out and about in bars so you can tell the design <clears throat> and the application and the color placements and colorways whatever it may be really resonate with um, the general public so they're definitely doing something right <clears throat> But I think the Cortez is a really difficult model to get going for whatever reason. Even though the Cortez is one of Nike's older shoe models, I think it came out in the 70s or 80s, so it's really, really old. For some reason, it doesn't seem to resonate with people the same way other models in that era probably would have. And I don't know what it is about the shoe. It's a classic silhouette. It's something that's quintessential to the brand. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there was a wasn't there a really interesting history behind this that this was a maybe an as asic was it an asics or something i don't know there's something about the model i think it might have been an asics or something and then when nike took off i'm not too sure anyway but there's some interesting um story behind the flipping quarters that i completely forgot this is some crooked tongues knowledge stuff but regardless i really like the sakai and nike cortez iteration i think it's a really interesting twist on it it's really cool to see a cortez which is usually known to be a very um slivet um sleek kind of sneaker be turned into this bulbous um thick heeled monstrosity that sakai always usually does they kind of increase the mass on the shoe all over the place from the sock liner to the to the outsole to the midsole to the toe box to the sushis everything's kind of been pop 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 popped up a little bit um and i love it i legitimately love it especially i love this weird addition which i think comes from the what's that it comes from the um, what's that thing called the 48 the four percent or whatever that running shoe is that everyone was wearing because it made you supposedly run quicker because it had like a plate on the front it looks similar to that with a bubble in the front there so it's cool to see a nike cortez with a bubble on it um it kind of reminds me of virgil abloh i mean sticking stuff in stuff and opening up midsoles and whatnot um but yeah they look pretty impressive i love the classic colorway with the white blue and red um i love again again how this midsole has been done i love that they've made them a little bit bulbous um, I love that they look a little bit more rugged than regular Cortez's look because I remember having a pair of Cortez's and one of the only things I hated about that is that they absolutely ended up wearing down really quickly, mostly due to the way that I walk and probably how redacted I am in terms of how I carry myself. But usually I found the front of the toe box here would get so mash up. Let me see if I can move it. Can I move it? Yeah. Would get so mash up and, and, cr and, and dirty and fucked that it would be quite hard to wear them after a few wears, especially if they're white. And I also recognize sometimes the heel, because the midsole was so soft, if you walked a particular way, it would wear down really quickly and you have this aggressive tilt from all the wearing down you've done, like similar to when you wear wallabies too much. That's what they remind me of, actually. They remind me of wallabies. Wallabies look really good brand new, but the moment you bang them in or wear them in, they look pretty horrible. They don't really have the lasting effect of an Air Force One or like even a Converse that just, even though you wear it a lot, it still maintains its integrity. Whereas I feel like Cortez's and wallabies kind of die the more you wear them on your feet. But I do really like these Sakai um, Nikes. I think they're great. I love the back heel with this sort of color combination that we have here, basically with, with two heel tabs and one, no, with two heel tabs. Is it heel tab? No, with two heel counters, do you be right? And this is a heel tab. You've got the red heel tab here with Nike Sakai written. you got the, the heel counter there with the blue suede, with the gray suede, a little bit of midsole detail, and then some of the stacked bits here on the back. And yeah, I'm a big fan of them. I like them. Um, it's just interesting because from what I've seen so far again, these product shots of these Sakai's, I don't know why it is about Sakai's, but Sakai's tend to look different in every picture you see, which probably is the reason why the reps of these are so popular and get bought by so many people because there's so many, maybe because of the way they put them together and the designer, but there's so many quality, um, uh, what's the thing called? Uh, there's so many quality issues with it from shoe to shoe that it's hard to figure out what's real what's fake and it's hard to figure out what looks good what looks like shit do you know what i mean it just it's a bit strange to kind of figure that whole out but i really like a look at them when are they due to come out here do we have an idea no idea on the date yet curse of nike yeah see it was yeah um the cortez original design was from 1972 yeah exactly i knew it why don't you send double set cool so i knew it was one of the oldest models but anyway um 
due to come out soon no idea on a date yet so if you're interested keep an eye out in all the regular places for them but they look absolutely stupendous in my opinion i really 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 like them and i can't wait to snag a pair and imagine when they drop they're going to be in loads of different colors we're going to get all black we're going to get some fruity color like a blue a purple a red or something and we probably might get a neutral like a gray or something right we're going to get those colors that sakai usually always do these are going to look flames in those colorways let's not let's not lie let's not lie okay moving on from that one we have news courtesy of cnet that finally finally the tesla semi trucks are gonna be available for reservations after many 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 years and delays and tesla are asking for a twenty thousand dollar deposit in order for you to secure your tesla cyber truck and if you're wondering what is a tesla cyber truck it's essentially a tesla but it's a truck um <laughs> that's basically it but the advantageous with this nature of this is that this could change the global supply chain thing going on at the moment because essentially if they're able to nail um autonomous driving and self-driving um system that they've got running in their cars you can essentially have a fleet of these delivering cargoes and shipments to different areas all over the world without the need of drivers which will ine inevitably you know lead to the elimination of strikes and unions and all that sort of stuff so you know this is really going to be a game changer in a world economic platform so let's quickly read this article because you've seen it it says at this point the tesla semi truck is starting to feel like one of those vehicles that exist somewhere in space between pure vaporware and production vehicle where there are working examples being tested in the wild but the production versions keeps getting pushed and pushed that could be set to change because according to a report monday by inside evs tesla is taking reservations and accepting deposits for the semi of course taking people's money for reservations for something and being anywhere near ready to deliver it on those reservations are two very different things new examples how about the model 3 which took two years between reservations and opening of the productions or the cyber truck for the other or the third gen or the next generation roaster neither of which have fully materialized yet what if you are a business owner you understand um testers rather loose interpretation of the, of the timelines and you still want to fork over the cash you get the process of doing so is not unlike the roadster first you have to pay a deposit via card five thousand dollars in this case and then you need to arrange a wire transfer to tesla for 15 within 10 days of making initial payment if you want more than one semi you have to write twenty thousand for each additional vehicle which deposits are refundable until you sign an actual purchase agreement which is pretty sick now it seems safe to assume based on tesla's track record that if when that if or when it does put the production of the electric semi it will be a fairly big deal and have the potential to at least partially upend the trucking industry we get the appeal but given that the model debuted in 2017 with a promised on sale date of 2019 it's now almost halfway 2022 and we suggest potential purchases da, da, da. but yeah you know the game, isn't it? it's going to be an absolute game changer let's not um let's not kind of you know beat around the bush if they're able to kind of um you know a self-driving and get these things out there to do what they say they're going to do it's going to absolutely change the landscape of the world it's going to be sad for the truckers of course because they're going to be out of a job quite instantly you'd imagine most firms would kind of um we kind of prioritize having cars that can drive themselves um then having people you know driving individual cars and if they're sick you know some not maybe not no one's there to kind of cover them and they look pretty badass as well to be completely honest they look absolutely incredible for a truck really 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 impressive looking so it'd be interesting too if, if people end up buying them so they can just drive them around i wonder if that's going to be a thing too some someone might put a reservation in just so they can have it like this so it looks cool because it looks quite cool without the um what's the thing called without the cargo in the back anyway so imagine if that imagine if that becomes a thing i'm just going to buy one just so i can have it parked up in my driveway absolutely nutty behavior but yeah big up tesla big up tesla moving on we have news again courtesy of myself regarding travis scott's at the billboard awards i thought this was interesting because as i've always said regarding this and what happened at the astro world tragedy and whatnot where you know 10 kids unfortunately lost their life at that concert and now you know people are trying to attribute blame for the most part there's court cases pending against travis against the event organizers against the local police there um against the event promoter all this sort of stuff i've always said that travis scott is legitimately one of the most brand friendly rappers that ever exists right he is somebody who legitimately is safe legitimately companies can look at him and say you know what 
if we get this guy to be part of our brand marketing he could legitimately affect our bottom line and he's legitimately safe from any public scrutiny or backlash he doesn't really get involved in drama online um he's not really someone that makes controversial opinions he keeps himself to himself and just bangs out the music so for the most part as a hip-hop artist he's super super brand friendly and i've always said too many people rely on travis scott he puts too many people's kids through school he pays for too many mortgages um too many people's you know um, bbls for them to just allow him to be drowned by in by these lawsuits so i'm pretty sure people in the background who have all the um interest in him and manage him and whatnot were doing their level best to ensure that any blame for the astro world tragedy was placed on the people who organized the event and not him being the artist so anything he might have done he might maybe have to make an enlargement or fault in some parts but he won't be legitimately at fault for the deaths of the kids that died at that festival that is not something that's going to happen and i think what we're seeing now with him popping out of these awards and performing on stages and stuff after the fact is that most people don't care they've moved on now the news cycle's completely moved on um ukraine's maybe basically taken up the you know the sort of um space in our brains for feeling sympathy for people who got you know killed in certain regard and it may be the stuff happening in buffalo and then of course this is also an indication that maybe his team know more than we know in the background that travis isn't going to get punished in any way shape or form regarding what happened to astro world because it wouldn't make any sense as a brand to put him out there in front of cameras and have people basically remember what happened to Asher every time they see him if you don't think that ultimately he's going to be able to get away with it. And I think this is what's going to happen. Legitimately, I generally think he's going to be completely fine. I always didn't think he would... I always thought he would be fine anyway. I just thought optically it looked really bad for you to perform one time at a festival, have all those kids die, and then you try to go up on Coachella. It just didn't make any sense to me. Or what he was trying to do right after the, the tragedy happened, trying to perform somewhere else to raise money. It's like, bruv, just relax and calm down. You're rich as hell. You don't need to perform right now. Just take a breather. Process what happened, whatever it may be, and then go from there. But, you know, everyone's got their way of dealing with things. So it's not who am I to say how he should have done it. But, you know, still, I don't think he'll be charged. I think this is basically confirmation of it. Him performing at the Billboard Awards and looking cool in his, I'm, I'm assuming, Matthew Williams for Givenchy or a Lick sponsored outfit. He looks pretty good. He's, he's there with Kylie Jenner on the red carpet wearing his Nikes that are due to come out. Nike. No, no, it's not. In, oh, sorry. It's the Hemp Dunks. Okay, I take it back. He's wearing Hemp Dunks, but still, he's still wearing Nikes. His endorsement hasn't been taken away from him. The the, the Nikes that Nike said they were going to put on hold are still coming out. You know, we've got release date. We've got release ones. Actually, looks fucking amazing in this outfit, to be fair. I'm pretty sure this is um, Matthew Williams. I'm pretty sure. Those look at like the Givenchy sneakers, and those look at like pants Matthew Williams would make. But yeah, um, I'm pretty sure he'll be fine it will be completely fine everything's moving in that direction the nikes that were postponed indefinitely are now available to purchase and they're going to be available to purchase very soon and yeah he'll be completely fine and you're going to see utopia come out very soon to his new album so if you are holding your breath for travis to end up in rikers island or something it's not going to happen mate he makes people too much money next we move on quickly mention this i wanted to mention about hype beast Am I the only one that's a little bit put off by some of these car ads they have going on in their platform? Considering this is majority a platform read, I guess, by kids who are between the ages of like 15 and, I don't know, 25. I assume most of them won't be able to afford a um, flipping Land Rover unless their parents have money. I would assume so, or unless maybe they're flipping the next Elon Musk and they've decided to build a company from scratch in their bedroom with their friend. But for the most part, you know, you'd imagine this wouldn't be something that most kids would be thinking of. But I guess if you're a brand and you do know that there's this captive market on Hypebeast that reads this platform, a market that has some level of disposable income, a customer base or a client base that is also willing and ready to you know spend high amounts of money to secure really covetable items why not place your item on here for long-term brain brand integration so that when i do turn 21 i do turn 22 and i finally do take my, my test and i finally got my license i might subconsciously remember 
that Land Rover that I liked seeing on Hypebeast and think that's my dream car and be like, oh, that's my dream car. It's like all the kids coming up now who like hip hop and shit, they all, all their dream cars are what? Rolls Royces, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Mercedes G-Wagons, because that's what everyone else drives. It's not exactly they have, like they have any sort of taste in cars. It's just the branding and the marketing of those cars has um, been um, really, really good. Do you know what I mean? And it's worked amazingly well. And I think that maybe is a long-term plan for all of this sort of stuff to kind of just place the brands next to these people so that, or to place the brands in front of these kids so that they just, it's ingrained in their brain and they got the funds to do so, they go and buy it. But I think overall it's a bit lame. Uh, I know this is probably all paid advertising and shit. So they probably, you know, Land Rover, you know, basically cuts a check and says, hi, please, hey, run this stories for a prolonged period of time. Here's some money. And that money goes a long way to pay salaries to ensure the lights are kept on in the office. You know, I know I know how the business is run, but I just think it's a little bit, a bit yucky personally for me. That's just my own personal opinion. But, you know, maybe I'm completely wrong in that regard. Maybe I'm completely wrong. We're going to quickly move on from that. And we're going to talk about the topic that I wanted to speak about for a while, which is concerning Nina Kravitz, um, clone records, Nastia, the war in Ukraine, Russia, Vladimir Putin, all that kind of stuff. So recently it's come to my attention, courtesy of Resident Advisor, that Nina Kravitz has been dropped from clone, her distributor for her label. Um, what's it called? Trap or Trip, whatever it's called, right? Trip, Trap, one of them. So she's been dropped on there um, primarily because of her silence or refusal to come out and disavow the war in Ukraine and to publicly say that she's not down with Putin um, and to kind of have a position on it publicly. That's essentially what she's been kind of um, punished for, it feels like. And I feel like, in my opinion, it's kind of unfair. Number one, of course, you know, people know that I'm a fan of Nina Kravitz, but even with all her issues. Um, I'm kind of a fan of the music and the DJing and kind of her legacy and, you know, how she's been able to kind of, you know, navigate the scene in interesting ways and the way she's going into doing live music kind of stuff, which kind of sucks really bad. But I also admire the, the courage to do so, because if you know you sound that bad and you're still doing it, you know, either you're a bit cuckoo or you legitimately think there's a longer game you're playing that might end up being beneficial to you later on when you're bored of pressing Q and mixing records on a stage. Cool, I feel that. But then the characters involved, they all leave a little bit of a yucky taste in my mouth. Nastya isn't really somebody that I would be willing to put my hat on. This is the same lady who only a few months ago at the height of COVID was still going to third world countries and playing there, flying hundreds of thousands of miles, spreading the disease, you know, in God knows places and deciding to go play, even though you'd imagine Nasty is at the level of a DJ who doesn't need to be playing these places in South America and India, wherever else that she was going in order to cut a check, because you'd imagine most of the checks that she's getting are like 20 grand plus. So you don't really know what people, people do with their money. I'm not watching their pocket, but it was just bizarre at the height of COVID when we were still all worried, when we were still kind of uh, paranoid. These people were out there flying around all over the place. And for whatever reason, you know, nothing happened to her in that regard. No distributor dropped her. No festival didn't book her. Things have been going on, still booked and busy. So for now, all of a sudden, Nasha to now be the person that everyone's kind of rallying behind and, you know, going to because, of course, she's Ukrainian and she's maybe the one that's speaking the loudest about the war in Russia and disavowing Putin and all this kind of stuff and really leading into the social justice side of things. It just leaves an icky taste in the mouth because they're all bad intentioned people, I feel like. I feel like, you, you know, Nina Kravitz is a bit of a troll and a bit of a shit poster. I feel like clearly Nasha is a little bit of a psycho in that she only cares about herself when it comes to the DJing things and especially when she was DJing during the whole Playgrave stuff and now this pivot into being suddenly the um, police warden of the internet in terms of telling people how they should and should not support the war in Ukraine and how they should come out and disavow Putin is just a little bit disgusting I feel like every person on this earth doesn't matter if you're an artist or a civilian you have the right to have no comment you also have the right to have an opposing comment of the masses out there if, if she if if Nina Kravitz is legitimately a fan of Putin then she should just come out and say so and I think sponsors and brands should be of course within their right to say cool now you said it out loud we are also somebody that doesn't fuck with him so we're gonna drop you you don't then you then can't complain and cry but I don't get how you can shitpost you control 
and then that could cost you your career because you're not willing to come out and have a position sitting on the fence isn't a punishable position i don't think so it's annoying it pisses you off it maybe would question your um your fandom of the person especially when you're seeing these visceral videos and clips and personal accounts from people in ukraine who are suffering at the hands of russia right this illegal invasion clearly it's going to hurt you and pull at your heartstrings but people are allowed to not say anything i don't think that's punishable crime and i just think the people involved again with nasha are just so yucky that i can't really get behind it in full especially when you look at you look at it deeper and you figure out that Nastya's boyfriend husband partner is you know closely aligned with Zelensky it's just a little bit yucky but anyway we digress in this um, article courtesy of RA it says in a statement posted last week clone founder Serge Vertrushko is this a Versesher said he was disappointed with Russia's artist's response to the war in Ukraine. Clone distribution has dropped Nina Kravitz and her trip label over the Russia's artist, the Russian artist's response to the ongoing war in Ukraine. The decision was outlined in the detail last week via a post on Clone's blog written by the founder Serge, aka Serge Versesher, aka Serge. So let's actually uh, read the, the the statement courtesy of Clone. So Clone said the following. <clears throat> For the past few weeks, receiving inquiries on a daily basis asking why Clone Distributing has ended this collaboration with Trip Recordings and Nina Kravitz. Even Time Magazine asks whether we had been an official statement about it, which until now we did not. So credit to Clone. They did it silently in the background. You know, maybe they didn't like her shit posting. They didn't like her refusal to say stuff. They didn't like that really incredibly stupid pieced drawing thing she did in an envelope. And they just thought, you know what, enough's enough, let's part ways. I respect that. Clone Records, however, doesn't have anything to hide. So with a due, due respect to the discretion of the label, uh, distribution relation requires, I don't mind to clarify. In the past, even after the annexation of Crimea, Nina Kravitz has put forward several outings that can be taken as pro-Putin. Moreover, she has clearly been flirting with CCSP USSR sentiments on several occasions while the USSR was a regime that was stood in repression of minorities as marginalized LGBTQ communities, a regime which murders millions of people. On Nina's latest upcoming compilation album, All His Decisions, also had a number of signs of USSR flattery are to be found. Yeah, she's a troll. She's got a track called All His Decisions. <laughs> okay this is um raising this is raising questions that in the light of the current russian aggression cannot be ignored next page as many people know it's nina Kravitz has gone quiet on social media once the war in ukraine started of course it is her right to keep quiet as she chooses but you're still punishing her for her to go quiet which is fucking insane this reminds me of what happened when the whole george floyd riots are happening and you had to post a black square why am i posting a black square for no is it george floyd or is it music what was the what was a black square for was it because rappers are getting locked up? Was it because of George Floyd? Was it because of Black Lives Matter? Now these now these flipping founders of Black Lives Matter are going out and buying mansions for themselves and none of that money is going back to the actual victims or the victims or the black victims that died as a consequence of the riots, police officers, shopkeepers, regular civilians. None of them get that coin, but you went to put a black square. But you're meant to stand up for Ukraine too. How about if you're somebody who has a personal experience with Ukraine that isn't too favorable? Are you meant to have sympathy for that nation because of what they're going through? Or are you meant to stand on, on, on you, on your own morals and, and how you see things? Or maybe you're looking at it thinking, you know what? It feels like the US are using this war as an opportunity to get Putin the hell out of here, right? Maybe, maybe you don't see that as something that you like to see because you're essentially viewing it as America meddling in other countries' politics, which hasn't, you know, historically worked out great for them. Maybe. I don't know what your reasons are. Whatever your reasons are for not having any sympathy for the Ukrainian people, you sh you're allowed to have them. It does make you look like a psycho. You do look like an absolute sociopath, but I understand it. And also the distributors and the companies that you're aligned with, they should have a right also to kind of, you know, end the relationship with you. But I don't see how you should be pushed to comment. That's the reason, that's the issue I have here. Push to comment either way is really annoying. It continues. Um, ba, 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 ba. She exit. oh yeah. She, however, ignored personal requests to talk. 
Moreover, having her label manager giving unsatisfying answers and poor excuses for not speaking and out wanting to commun or and not wanting to, to communicate in general. The communications with her label manager I considered rather manipulative, and her stances were being put forward in vague Putin-esque expressions like she wants peace. <laughs> of course, she is against the war. Woefully lacking any meaningful conditions. Does she want Ukraine to surrender to put the war to stop? Does she want peace under Putin's terms? Other Russian artists, many unlike. Uh, Nina living in Russia have spoken now in the first days of the war and some even now uh, please know at the in in the first days of the war there was no law in which did forbid you to speak about it okay cool so I guess some people are hiding behind this new law I can't speak because my, my family might die it's like bitch you don't speak to your family shut up it's disappointed therefore that she publicly or privately hasn't made known that she doesn't support the Russian violence or has shown any sign of empathy with the victims there are for yo DJs don't have empathy in the first place, mate. They all think they're fucking God's gifts to earth when most of us could do their jobs with their eyes closed. Most of these people were out DJing in the height of the pandemic when we were all scared, when we were all seeing videos of bodies being piled on top of each other in open morgues in flipping India and places in South America and Central America and all these third world countries were suffering, suffering and getting crippled by COVID. You remember what was happening in flipping Italy at that time when whole households were getting wiped out from COVID from grandma to, to parents to whatever because they all happened to share one building that they lived in because they're a flipping family and they were getting wiped out and people were still playing flipping techno tech house events in flipping Italy with masks on the, in the outside saying I'm so happy to be back. People taking flights on um, empty airplanes, Dak Shay and playing in places. People that blow and saying the rave was sick i don't care how many people i might have infected that played there these guys don't have empathy bro that's the whole reason why they stand on top of a stage playing other people's music thinking as if they're actually doing anything you have to have no empathy to be that person and to have your arms spread out wide like a flipping angel thinking you're someone you have to have no empathy how else can you be a person and do that job with empathy it's impossible to do so i try to do so on my little platform that i do it but who am i really in the grand scheme of things I'm no flipping, I'm no Blawan, right? Come on, brother, man. This is the reason why. So this whole empathy thing is bullshit, bruv. Bullshit. Bullshit. It's all selective. I personally think, and again, this is something I'm going to make a point of rule before I finally finish the article. I personally think the issue at hand here is that Nina Kravitz is a bitch. In the same way that Peggy Goo is a bitch. And I mean this in, with, in all respect. They're clearly people who are very disagreeable, have very disagreeable personalities. People that, if you're not their friend, you can understand why people would not like them in person. I can, I can truly see that for both of them. I can see that in them, which is fine. You're allowed to be a bitch. You're allowed to be annoying. You have to be a bit obtuse. That is your right, especially when you're famous and you're somebody of notoriety because people would, would still try and suck your dick and lick your ass because of who you are and they want to get next to you. I don't think being a bitch and being a... Yeah, I don't think being a bitch is enough to try and get someone's career cancelled. I don't think being a bitch is enough to look for an excuse to get someone the hell out of you or to limit the ability for them to put food on the table and to support their family and stuff or to support their artists. For instance, the, the, the artists on Trip who have nothing to do with this issue, who are just signed to her label, are now being punished because she's refusing to come out and have a stance either way. And people are interpreting that as her being pro-Putin. Is If there's no hardcore evidence of her being pro-Putin, you can't do this. I'm, of course, like I said, I'm okay with companies having a stance where you have to be, like, you have to line up with our ideology. I, don't, I think it's stupid anyway in business. I think everyone's dollar is a dollar. It's worthwhile, right? You're not going to turn away a Republican just because you don't like their political views if they're buying your records. I wouldn't think so, but if you are, you're an absolute psycho, right? But imagine you're going to do that. You're, you're, you're wiping out half of the population, but cool, regardless, we move on. If you've got your own personal company, you should be allowed to say, hey, unless you align with my politics, you can't distribute on my company. Cool. But you don't know what my politics are. And I'm okay to not tell you. I shouldn't have to tell you in order to get your distribution. But if you say that's one of the, re that's one of the requirements, then fair enough. I don't get it. But you gave her distribution, knowing that she's a bit of a shit poster, knowing that she might have some flirtations with Putin, all this sort of stuff. Didn't she have a party at some fucking palace with Peggy Goo? Didn't, didn't that happen in the middle of the pandemic? Didn't she do that? There was some party they did. I don't know whose birthday party it was. Maybe it was Peggy Goo's birthday. It was some fucking opulent palace that looked like something that was sponsored by the CCP. Do you know what I mean? It's not something... 
this is not this is not some this is not some minor thing that she booked on Airbnb. This is something where some diplomat said, "Hey, da 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 da." You know what I mean? Here's the thing. Play the thing. Play at my daughter's 18th birthday party. So this should be no surprise to people. I just think they're looking for an excuse to get her the hell out of here because they don't like her as a person. She's very annoying. She's very, you know, she has, like I said, she's a bitch, essentially. But I don't think being a bitch is enough to get your career cancelled. Personally, for me. Let's go back to the article. Um, it hasn't murdered her. Um, other artists are many unlike Nina living in Russia have spoken out. It is disappointing, therefore, that she publicly or privately hasn't made it known that she doesn't support Putin or Russian violence or has shown any sign of empathy for the victims, therefore. And I already went on my empathy rant. Um, by, refusing to choose to, by refusing to choose sides and by not speaking out, Nina enables herself to continue her lifestyle and her life as a performing artist as if nothing have is happening. <sighs> Oh, let's continue while the looting the raping the murdering and the destruction of the country by her countrymen continues this is a stark contrast to other situations where she has shown herself to be an opinionated person uh, always willing to have a conversation let me be very clear about the fact that this is her right to do so she is free to stay silent and of course she's allowed to keep her political views to herself and to live her life as she wishes she may well have her personal reason to justify her behavior but as a business partner of clone records is equally free not to conveniently accept those these reasons fair that's a fair response that's a fair paragraph i think that's entirely fair personally for me in an ideal world i would completely rid music or any form of creative expressions from politics or rid it of politics i don't think it's necessary unless the artist themselves wants to maybe imbue their politics their worldview in their art as a way to maybe inform you of their worldview and their politics cool but this kind of um, cloud or this kind of palette that you have to choose from where there are certain things going on in the world politically and you have to choose which one you want to imbue in your art but you don't get to choose what stance you take on each of those points you don't get to be nuanced you have to just agree with the group thing that's going on out there in the public is bizarre bizarre to say the least because let's god forbid if a few years ago or a couple of years ago you dare to get on a record and start talking about masks are silly you shouldn't need to wear them um don't double jab kids like all this stuff on a record you would have got completely deleted from society but nowadays if you if you would have said even oh it was a lab leak or something people would have absolutely destroyed you but nowadays you say it, it's completely okay to say so so society has moved quickly in those last two years to a point where people are okay to have a conversation sensible one that maybe you shouldn't be double dosing kids because it, it, this virus seems to only affect a certain demographic of people you know in being vulnerable being old being unhealthy being unfit wherever it may be overweight blah 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 blah, blah. this is something that obviously changes so i just i, I just feel like the, the, they keep moving the goalposts all the time and for me it gives me a feeling that it's mostly due to her being the person that she is and being somebody that's comp that's very very um unlikable right let's get back on the article there it is so um i like this i like this paragraph right there it continues while she's still touring the world and enjoying the benefits of the freedom of the western world she chooses not to live under putin's oppression yet she using putin's law as an excuse not to speak out and remain silent therefore the way nina kravitz chooses to stay silent can be considered to be out of opportunism hypocrisy and abuse again you are really projecting there she has not said any of these things um thereby going against the values on which the house of techno music and their represented um cultures are built bro hasn't she been trolling about putin for ages I've seen her posting memes and stuff back when it was back when it was somewhat socially obsessed, um, acceptable to post memes about Putin in the same way people post memes about Colonel Gaddafi or, Sir, or Saddam, Saddam Hussein and shit. Right. Like boss, all this kind of stuff like people would. She was doing that often. No one had an issue with it then. Then, then it gets real and you see actual victims, you see actual bodies on the floor. Now suddenly it becomes something people get uncomfortable with. Come on, man. Anyway, it continues. The cultures and communities from which Nina did build her name, we see this silence as a sign of double standards and d disinterest, and we consider it a symptom of toxic positivity and toxic ignorance. What does that even mean, bruv? Toxic, anyway, in the techno scene that clone record shows not to represent. The house and techno scene are supposed um, to stand up for minorities, for the less privileged, and for the oppressed, and for the freedom of expression. It is built up by the minorities and oppressed people, and we should not allow ourselves to forget just that. Oh, fuck off. 
Show me the evidence and proof, bro. How many lineups you see of people that look like myself playing on there outside of fucking Carl Cox and, you know, his flipping um, smiley face? How, of them, how many of them be people like myself do you see playing on there? How many, forget people that look like me, how many new people that you haven't seen listed on the Beatport 100 do you see playing at these big festivals? Please tell me. Oh, wait. The most newest, freshest thing we have going on at the moment in this entire scene is this hardcore fast gabber shit that people all the kids are playing now that's been spearheaded by possession and people still hate that that's the legitimately one organic new thing that we have going on where we actually have an influx of female women djs coming into industry um non-binary all this sort of stuff like actually representing on that stage lgbtq plus queer people on the big scale getting booked in big venues only from that one genre actual mainstream techno where they're actually been pushing people that aren't representative in the wide mainstream world of techno where is it i don't see it they don't exist they don't exist come on man this is nonsense all this posturing is absolute bs absolute bs from time Derek may is still on stages and you have various witnesses with corroborating stories coming out and saying how he abused them he abused them there says everything you need to know about me about the, the dance music scene everything everything selective 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 nina kravitz is too big to fail there are enough people who don't know who don't care so they want her to fail why do you mention this for or because they are privileged enough to say it's about the music or who just see the money privilege how can it be privileged oh i'm not worried about a career i'm worried about the toxic behavior which rottens the scene and the culture which gave us the music we celebrate every day i worry about the values of the house and techno culture um, while many festivals and clubs conveniently accept her as a right to remain silent, we, in our opinion, have all the response, have all the reason to end the collaboration, even if she would distance herself from past US uh, flattery in the near future, and even if she would take a distance from pro out to get some point. So, even if she decides to bend the knee and kiss the ring and kiss your feet, it still isn't enough because she hasn't done it in your time frame. Cool. Or the way that you want it to be done. Tolerance, isn't it? Cool. Redemption cool we won't we won't be waiting for a sign of empathy and the victims of russia's aggressions while the murdering raping continues we cannot wait and hope for a, a statement and a personal message or actions showing that she stands for the same models of which the house and scene are brooded while we already have several signs that she doesn't simply put this is not a moral behavior and energy we want to represent or be associated with it's funny that they put in so much so much so much weight on nina kravitz not saying anything as if it actually matters do you think the victims in maripol the victims in kiev the victims in ukraine overall do you think they're in there in those bunkers shaking riddled with fear some of them losing close family members some of them with no family members whatsoever you see those videos of those horrifying videos of a kid on the side of the street with a car with his entire family murdered buried in a ditch including the fucking dog do you think those people are actually worried that nina kravitz doesn't come out and say that she's anti-putin do you think those people actually give a shit like on the ground it's people who aren't actually there, who aren't, are actually directly affected by it, who are pushing and rallying for people to get in line to say something and to kind of coerce and get in line with this group finger to come out with the exact same phrase of wording that they want to be said, like Slava, whatever it may be. It's just annoying. We know what's going on there. It's absolutely horrible, as is every war that's happening in the entire world at the same time, some of which are happening to black and brown people that people don't give a fuck about because guess what? They don't look like the majority of the world, especially the Western world. They don't care. That's why people care about Ukraine so much because they look exactly like you. I get it. Cool. It's horrible. Putin is an animal. Putin is a monster. Cool. But let's call it as it is. Don't try and sugarcoat it. And also, like I said before, I generally do think electronic music especially dance music doesn't need to do this there are so many issues at hand at the moment that still haven't been addressed that need to be addressed then to go over there and say oh because you're not having a stance on putin that legitimately means that you're not for this scene you're not for this music we're going to take away your opportunities to make a living it's absolutely nonsensical for me personally absolutely nonsensical especially considering the other things people get away with in this scene it makes no sense this is the line that you want to draw now this is the line come on 
I hope this sufficiently um, clarifies and explains my personal stance as well as the standpoint actions taken by Clone Records, Clone Distribution. Everyone should make their own decision. I'm not coming out to cancel anybody. Oh, really? You're not coming to cancel anybody? <laughs> okay. Make your own decisions of what energy you want to pour and allow it for your life. All right, cool. That's what Clarence to say. And then, of course, Nina actually made an update and spoke about She was spoke about it. Let's see what she has to say. Is she still trolling? Let's see. If I were asked to illustrate, this is Nina's um, thing. If I were asked to illustrate the apogee of determinism. Oh, here she goes. Here she goes, she pulled out her Fiosaurus and she's going to hit us to death with intellectualism to try and weave her way out of this one. Okay, if I were to, if I were asked to illustrate the apogee of determinism, I would give as an example the times we happen to live in right now. Everything that we have been involved in in the past decades has reached its peak when ruler streams of lies and hatred, the reason for which are not always obvious, inevitably lead to violence, instability, conflicts between people, between countries. Momentum is growing day after day. What the fuck is she talking about? Accordingly, terrible events get mixed up on social networks and in media with daily routine. In some of these cases, all of these conflicts with established beliefs, such as personal values and lifestyle, we are doomed to be part of. Yo, you know what? this sounds like this sounds like it, i know i don't know sure if some of you have done it but i i took english literature in college i was going to actually major in a university but i then switched to product design in cedric so martins but whatever i took english literature and i love literature i love reading i love fiction love non-fiction and when you used to do english literature test you sometimes get a question on a piece of text you have to analyze or expound upon whatever it may be and one of the tricks to fill in the word count and to fill pages was to basically um, rewrite the question as an opening statement to what you eventually want to go on and say in a roundabout way. So use all this fluffy language to kind of just fill up a paragraph so that you have one paragraph filled so you can go to the next page and start actually answering it in your own words. That's just what, what it actually sounds like. Next page. As a person, musician and artist, I'm deeply moved. I, I'm actually just going to say woman. She should have put that in there. Um, as a person, musician and artist, I'm deeply moved by what's happening in the world. Um, it's appalling what, what, what my country's relations with Ukraine have become. <laughs> relations. <laughs> relations. I'm against the forms of violence. I'm praying for peace. And, and it pains me to see innocent people die. Of course you are. I'm a musician and as, as was never involved in supporting politicians or political parties. And I'm not planning to do so in the future. I don't understand politics or the social processes it, it creates, so I don't think it is right to talk about what's happening on social media. In my opinion, it might increase the degree of all-consuming hatred and does not assist in understanding, according to Seneca, a Roman stoic. Oh, I knew it! She'd been reading Ryan Holiday. She thought, you know what? Let's just, ah, uh, fucking... Me. This is the, honestly, this is the person that you're losing your brain cells over. This woman's a grown adult, a grown adult, and she sounds like an absolute spow Ow. You know that word I was going to say, <laughs> you know? Like, come on, man. Come on. This is the person you're worried about. She's out here quoting Ryan Holiday books and stuff like, come on. Statesman and, uh, sorry, um, uh, philosophy. She, she's even, look what she did. She used... That part, that bit of the text to explain who, who flipping um, Seneca is. We know who he is, family tree. Come on. According to Seneca, Roman Stoic and philosopher, statesman, dramatist, the feud itself will be ex exiting, extinguished if one side refuses to support it. What? In recent months, I have, I have faced hatred and lies against me, and I'm not sure if that's because my statements didn't appear on Instagram. It saddens me, but it hasn't made me better. You haven't made any statements. That's what people are, are, are pointing to. This is why I also don't like with people like this, right? If you're going to shit post and you're going to be a troll, stand on your shit post. Stand on it. In the same way these leftists stand on their thing of like, if you don't agree with my ideology, you can't come in my club, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Safe space. Bang. They stand on it. They actually get rid of you if you're if you're a douche, if you're a bro, if you have too much masculine. All this stuff, I, I like it. I like they stand on something. If you're going to be a shit poster, stand on the shit posting. Yeah, what? I'm not getting involved in politics. That's it. I don't have any statement. You know, Slava Ukraini, whatever you may be calling, just keep it moving. Don't now go, oh, they're coming out bullying me. It's like, come on. I always believed that the mission of the music and musicians, electronic music, techno house scene is to unite completely different people, erasing boundaries, borders, and patterns rather than divide them. 
it's interesting because when you look at Nina Kravitz's crowd, it doesn't really look the most, uh, you know, multicultural. But hey, it's, that's, a, it's, <laughs> that's a statement for another day. When people are born, they choose neither parents nor country of birth. So when releasing compositions, compilations on my label trip recordings, it was uh, it was the talent of the artist that mattered to me, not the country of birth. I intend to continue to follow the principles to unite uh, despite attempts to censor the work of the artist on my label. I wonder what's happening with those artists on trip. Are they getting pressured on social media to, to also disavow Nina Kravitz and, you know, basically jump off the, the label? They're like, no, nah, I'm not jumping off the label. This fucking label's paying my rent. Do you know what I mean? That's where politics, that's, that's real politics. Real politics is that. Working class people having to make actual decisions that are going to impact their actual present mid to long-term future. They have to actually juggle those things, not what's happening on flipping privileged side of Twitter with social and media elites who have no real vested interest in Ukraine, no real skin in the game. And they're out here virtue signaling, trying to make you feel bad for not having a statement on something that you don't even understand. Some of you people out there didn't even know where flipping Kiev was on the fucking map. And now suddenly you're all flipping out there with your blue and yellow flags. I get it. It's a horrible to see it, but the hypocrisy with people, with humans, is just oh we're all full of shit but at least recognize you're full of shit anyway it continues making re and releasing and playing good music is what i love most peace okay she's a troll bro what does she actually say in that statement nothing she still didn't disavow putin so you know we actually know where she stands it is what it is but i still think in my opinion that this has more to do with people thinking nina kravitz is a bitch than than them not liking what she did or did not say about um the war in ukraine i honestly do think that and which is you know which is okay it's, it's their right to do so you know it is what it is but it's just interesting to see it play out in real time it actually is interesting to see it play out in real time um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments down below what you think. Do you think clone records are within their right to, you know, basically tell Nina to kick rocks? Do you think Nastia has a leg to stand on coming out and absolutely ragging on Nina Kravitz this entire time this stuff has been going on? Especially considering her very sketchy um, history in, you know, playing plague raves and essentially endangering huge swaths of people in real life. I don't think Nina Kravitz refuses to say comments or say anything concerning the war has actually killed anybody, but it could be argued that flipping Nasha going out and performing at all these plague raves has this legitimately led to people's deaths. I'm not being flipping dramatic and stuff to say this, and, you know, I'm just my opinion, I'm just stating it from what I see out there, but it could be argued that. One of the other things to note too is like the lack of backbone and the uh, you know the jellyfish backbone nature of some of these artists in the dance community especially some people that i actually like miss kitten being a good example i love miss kitten i love kitten what she's changed her name to i love the album that came out recently um with the hacker absolutely incredible i love everything that she puts out a really supreme dj but this announcement is really lame really lame she didn't have an issue with being on trip beforehand, but now everything has come to pass. She's now kind of, you know, essentially throwing Nina and trip under the bus. Horrible. So this is courtesy of, Nina, of Miss Kitten's uh, Instagram account. It says as follows. Release statement, trip recordings. Yes, I have a track called Continue on the awkward named All His, De All His Decisions release. You well, you put it on there. And, uh, let's continue. I wrote it and sent it during the lockdown two years ago in 2020, far before the terrible invasion of, of, of the invasion and crimes of Russia against Ukraine. So before she paid attention to maybe Nina Kravitz being a troll and before she knew that she makes these pro Putin sentiments, which were widely known in the scene. OK, cool. I strongly condone it and support Ukraine since day one. You know that I even gave a sto a strongly engaged track to Russia. Uh, I, oh, I even gave a strongly engaged track in Russian written at the same time before the war for the first compilation raising funds for the earliest days together with Ukraine. So she's like, look, guys, don't attack me. I'm with you guys. I have Ukrainian friends, too cool the trip release was ready to uh, far before the war the lyrics of continue were pre were predominant what premonitory again a resistance what, what does that word mean premonitory i've never heard that a resistance message to never give up in times i envisioned another job now strongly resonating to everybody fighting oppression fighting for freedom nina played it at all nina played it a lot Sorry, uh, I decided not to take my track out because I assume everything I do, no matter the circumstances, even stronger now that my message happens to be on a Russian label, I respect, but not in, not his boss, silence and position. Also, in respect to Russian artists and friends and fans in danger, I strongly wouldn't be part of this project if it would be taking place after the war and full of information coming out of it. So you clearly ignored what was out there about Nina 
because you wanted to put the track on her label because the exposure was great. And now that it's got too hot in the kitchen, you're thrown under the bus. Cool. Therefore, I'll condone. Uh, so I'll donate all benefits from the track to trustworthy Ukrainian fundraising groups recommended by my Ukrainian friends. <laughs> Loads of Ukrainian. Imagine you replace Ukraine with black and African. Um, those are my African friends. Well, my music, lyrics, life and guidance were always and will always be on the side of human rights. My career shows it. Otherwise, I would not still be here. What does human rights have to do with DJing? You think Sven Var cares about human rights? <laughs> what you think damien Lazarus cares about human rights you think jamie jones cares about human rights you think nastia cares about human rights you think um what's his face carl cox cares about human rights come on it is the first time we fellow artists on this release have to face such situations reminding us how social political our work is so we should never forget it i don't i am assuming my track and assuming my track on this release is part of it thanks for reading kitten so clearly a kick in the face while you're down in it that's what happens all the time in it with these artists they don't really have a leg to stand on no backbone whatsoever and when everyone else starts telling them what to do they just do what they say but hey what do you guys think in the comments let me know down below do you think nina was you know is being unfairly treated do you think it's completely fair her getting kicked off the label do you think more artists should come out and make their political leanings known where they stand on certain issues do you think it doesn't matter in this large scheme of things like i don't let me know in the comments down below i'd love to know your opinion on it i would love to know your opinion on it next we're going to talk about this this is courtesy of outlander magazine on twitter it's featuring the jack moose and nike collaboration which i think is absolutely tritter 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 trash i think it's absolutely trash firstly because it doesn't make any sense why jack moose at this stage of their career would be concentrating on doing a nike collaboration secondly i think it's proof that the brand is on life support and the jack moose that we knew previously the one that made effervescent almost magical um otherworldly clothes in a very simple and elegant way that sort of purported to represent and to showcase a particular type of woman a particular type of french lady let's say has now gone completely to shit to the point where they're having to struggle to for relevancy by doing a collaboration with nike on shoes that don't even look like something a jack moose girl would actually wear and if you're thinking i'm absolutely lying let's actually go and say jack moose is it? Hey, so is it Jack Jack Moose? Jack Jack Moose, right? There we go. Let's go Vogue Runway. Let's actually look at some of the older pieces of Jack Moose collection from the previous collections, what I think were way better than the stuff that he's doing nowadays, so that we can see quite clearly that this brand has changed fundamentally in the last few years to the point where it's unrecognizable. And the reason why I keep talking and rabbiting on about it is because I'm not someone that sort of like, you know, waves a black cloud around and gets on my soapbox about that kind of stuff. But I think fashion's really annoying, especially nowadays when it comes to streetwear. There's a real big disregard to streetwear's influence on fashion, especially men's fashion. There's a lack of respect put on streetwear's name in terms of being legitimately one of the main reasons why people actually give a shit about fashion shows still nowadays. And it's kind of seen as this kind of pinnacle of, you know, achievement if you are involved in the clothing industry and all this sort of stuff and i feel like in general the underlying issues with it is that a lot of the people in fashion industry have a general disdain for the invasion it feels like of black and brown people into their hallowed little space and a way to kind of insult us and to kind of demean us and put us down without making us feel as if it's something racial is to talk about the return of tailoring talk about streetwear being dead and all these little i feel like dog whistles that kind of diminish the influence that streetwear and people from black and brown communities have had on fashion from day dot until right now and i feel like sometimes these designers also are judged really differently based mostly i think on their skin color on where they're from and of course which college they did or did not go to and it's no surprise that someone like a jack moose who looks the way he does and is from the place he's from is able to get away with putting out mediocre after mediocre collection especially considering the bar that he came in with he came in on a high bar he came in with flipping horses on his runway right rep like actual look look at these pieces here from 2015 only right and it's gone to complete shit over the years to the collections from 2022 all the way to maybe 20 where they go to shit i would say from the my eye looking i'd say 20 yeah 2022 to maybe 2019 when they went to shit or maybe 20 yeah 
2019. But you look at this collection here from 2019, this one, right? Um, and you look at this one here, 2018. I think that's the one with the big hat. This really pales into comparison to what Jack Moose is doing at the moment. But for whatever reason, he doesn't get the same level of hate that someone like a God Bless the Dead, Virgil Abloh was getting with his collection, or even Kanye when he launched his first collection. So for some reason, some designers get you know, the blind. Some people turn a blind eye. They bury their head in the sand when their stuff isn't as great. But this stuff from Jack Moose in 2019 was legitimately beautiful, objectively great, objectively talking about something interesting, the casting, the, the fabrication, the materials, the cuts, the shapes, the silhouettes, the designs, everything about it was just really expertly and beautifully done. You can't deny it that this doesn't look great, even to uh, an, an, an untrained die you can tell this is absolutely sterling work from a designer coming up in the industry then you look back at this collection here that i've just focused on and um, i pulled out of my ass which is which one um which is spring 2018 again absolutely paled into comparison what he's doing nowadays with his brand but absolutely wonderful i think i think if i'm not mistaken yeah, this is what the collection with the big hat um 2018 that absolutely dominated social media for maybe a couple of years after the fact when it was out yeah it was absolutely everywhere every single editorial had it. i think remember it was that famous editorial of no nomi campbell completely naked just wearing the hat you know on the floor and it's amazing pose amazing 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 stuff yeah great great work then you look at the stuff that he does recently and it's terrible it legitimately is no better than something that you'd find in cos in zara and shit it's just garbage and a good a clear example of this garbage is definitely this nike collaboration coming up because it makes absolutely no sense for the brand because you would imagine there is nothing about the jack moose girl or guy that would tell you that they're into hiking zero it's all beach wear, it's all field wear, it's all in town wear, it's all opulence, decadence in a very subtle, minimal, kind of effervescent way. But you would never say it's giving hiking. There's nothing about this that gives hiking at all. Zero. Zero. I would go as far as saying there's no one in this runway collection, maybe apart from this dude, who looks like they could do a pull-up. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So what is all this hiking nonsense about? But again, the, the brand's gone to complete shit. And a clear example of that, I think, is this Nike collaboration. They're on life support and they're having to pull out these collabs and make no sense. They've got a lot hard that they're collaborating on. And this looks like a Nike 3.50. You know those shoes everyone was wearing back in the day? All done in leather, like with no lining. Absolutely butters. Butters, 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 butters. Like, I, it doesn't make any sense. Of course, they'll probably end up doing pretty well because it's a designer collaboration. But this is proof to me that it's on life support. It's also interesting to see the lack of kickback that's coming against the brand considering who's head like, heading it and whatnot but i think it is absolutely garbage i don't get why you designed these shoes for a person or a client who looks like this on the runway it makes absolutely no sense especially like i said considering jacquemus's roots and the woman or the client it used to represent look like this would this girl would this girl on look 513 of this jacquemus look would she want to wear these shoes Really, would she be into this this dress or skirt or whatever outfit this is with this back thing and the really cringy Nike thing? This looks like something sporty and rich would make. That's what it looks like. This looks very sporty and richest. And I don't mean that in a good way because that brand is garbage too. But look at that. Look how clever this was back in the day. That mini bag, the lovely dress, the great little necklace accessories, the amazing heels, the makeup and hair done really minimally. Like just gorgeous. The casting moi like look at it absolutely incredible the kind of french woman represents because i think he always says it represents like the french ladies that he grew up around amongst him and his mom right like this kind of wistful vision that he had of these matriarchs all surrounding him and this is kind of his way of honoring them on the runway and empowerment the bloody blah 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 does this give you empowerment or does this give you some girl going to a fucking pilates class with tights and white socks on carrying a flipping water flask like, this is terrible man absolutely terrible all absolutely garbage and um yeah it's just interesting to see the lack of uh pushback against this because of course jack Moose is somebody people actually rate as opposed to the black designers who people don't respect because they're black or because they make skatewear or streetwear it's absolutely deplorable absolutely deplorable it's got a tattoos out there and it? it's absolutely cool outfit gorgeous like come on man he's fallen off by his own regard he's fallen off there's no way we cannot say he's fallen off but yeah maybe i don't know anything let me know in the comments down below what you think and if you disagree with me i'd love to hear your opinions on it regarding this okay so that has been the agostino zinga show episode number five seven seven 
Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time taking out my show, make sure, make sure you smash that like button if you liked it. Smash the dislike if you didn't like it. Click subscribe if you want to come back. Leave me a comment if you have some thoughts and feelings. If you listen to the audio podcast, please share it, share it, share it. That would be greatly appreciated. That's the only way it's going to get out to people. I don't put any marketing or ad spend behind this. I probably should because I'm a dumb dumb. but it is what it is. If you can help me on that way, do that. If you can also support the Patreon if you want bonus episodes regarding myself, you could also do that at, ag- at patreon.com for slash Agostino. It's patreon.com for slash Agostino, which is in the description of the show or you can find it on my social media platforms but it's pretty self-explanatory it's patreon.com forward slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o and for as little as one dollar the equivalent of one pound per month you get access to all my bonus episodes which equates to one bonus episodes per week sometimes two and that bonus episode is only available on patreon to nobody else but the patreon subscribers so make sure you jump on there and support thank you so much for all of you guys that are on there regardless but yeah this has been 577 of the show I'm going to close this out with a track taken from Kendrick Lamar's new album called Mr. Moral and the Big Steppers. It's a track produced by Ken by Pharrell Williams, my favorite producer of all time. It features Kendrick Lamar and Tana Leone. Please check it out. It's an amazing album. It's an amazing track. I'll close it out for you guys listening to the audio podcast. If you're watching the video, then just click it and open another tab and do it because I'm not going to do it on my channel. I don't want to get demonetized. And I'll see you guys another time. Peace.